So we are very happy today uh, to be joined by uh, Orit Peleg, whose work, as you're going to see, is incredibly relevant uh, to everything we're doing. Orit uh, did her degree in actually physics and computer science um, in Israel um, <laughs> at Bar Ilan uh, University. Um, uh, and is one of the, the few scientists actually having, of course, I don't know this stuff, I like everyone, I look it up, but you actually have a Wikipedia page, which is A, incredibly helpful, but B, I think must very much standardize your introductions as everyone just reads <laughs> verbatim what's written here. Um, so, um, but I, I'll give you the, the sort of short version. Um, she then um, uh, did a PhD uh, at ETH Zurich, so very much uh, in the neighborhood, in simple models of competitive interactions in biophysical systems. Um, but as you're gonna to see today, um, Aurid is one of these fantastic scientists that again transcends uh, disciplinary boundaries and sort of uses uh, techniques and, and modeling approaches um, from computer science um, and physics in living systems to offer new insights. Um, and so also from this Wikipedia, um, I think it's here or maybe somewhere else, uh, it says you're a specialist in soft what is it? Soft biological systems, which made me wonder what a hard biological system is, but maybe you can get to that in the talk. Um, and as you're going to also see, um, uh, it takes a very uh, uh, broad taxonomic um, coverage in her work. Um, so, of course, today um, we're going to uh, hear about honeybees, um, but then cellular systems. And uh, Orit and I also uh, have a project together looking at plants, which is odd because I think neither of us inherently study plants. Somehow we got uh, roped into that. Um, and lastly, before I hand over to Orit, uh, I'll just uh, give one plug. Um, uh, although the abstract deadline has passed, um, Orit and I uh, are part of a, uh, an editorial committee um, for a special edition of Frontiers um, in physics um, called um, the physics of social interactions. So if anything you see today um, inspires you to um, submit uh, an abstract to that uh, special edition, just uh, throw it in and we'll, we'll consider it uh, as a late entrance um, as well. Okay, so with that, thank you, uh, Rita. We're all looking very much forward to this and over to you. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I, uh, I only discovered I have a Wikipedia page like a week ago. I don't know who did this, <laughs> but thank you, you know, if you're here or anywhere. Um, okay, so uh, thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, I'm, I'm really honored and humbled because um, uh, Ian, Kauzin's work has always been a, a major inspiration for, for uh, the things that I do today. Um, and uh, so it's, it's fantastic to have the opportunity to, uh, as always, interact with Ian, but also with the rest of the group. Um, and I'd love to have your feedback on, on some of these um, uh, works that I'm going to uh, present today. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, honeybees and honeybee swarms. and. Um, I don't think I really need to introduce the, the concept of collective behavior to you, um, but I just wanted to um, briefly set the stage to the kind of collective behavior that I'm, I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I'm um, pretty much you know, in line with, with the work that you do in, in your group. I'm really interested in how uh, animals and organisms uh, sense their local environment. Um, whether that, you know, some, some seminal examples of that is, is chemotaxis in cells and phototropism in, in plants, um, olfactory search in, uh, in insects. Um, and then how does all of this come together when, when you put a lot of organisms uh, in one spot? Um, a few examples that I'm sure, again, that you're all familiar with, uh, slime mold, uh, um, foraging, ant uh, pheromone laying, uh, and, and swarms of uh, large groups of fish, uh, birds, and, and insects. Um, I uh, want to make a, a slight distinction um, uh, on, on the kind of work that I'm going to present today, uh, which sometimes we refer to as a, um, a small extension of classical stigmogy, uh, where um, in, in more classical stigmogy, I think, uh, uh, this is just one example of that behavior. So we have um, organisms that uh, deposit information in the environment. Uh, in this case, we have an Argentine ant uh, finding a, um, a food source and on the way back to the nest, uh, she is touching her abdomen to the surface and marking it with a pheromone uh, trail. 
Um, and when you have a lot of these ends together, then of course they can create a, a sophisticated dynamic uh, um, paths that are, that are somewhat optimal uh, to the food source or to the, uh, from the food source to the nest and, and vice versa. Um, but these, uh, these kind of um, information that is being deposited is first of all just being uh, deposited and then it's kind of uh, diffused um, uh, more passively. And um, also I want to talk about uh, um, a few examples today where um, we have some indirect communication through fields, physical fields that are um, less local than, than this example. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to talk about physical fields of flow and mechanics. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate this concept uh, for, for some of the examples that I'm going to show, and hopefully um, this will become more clear then. Um, okay, so for the outline today, uh, I want to talk about two sets of problems. Uh, the first one is related to fields of mechanics, um, and that is related to um, honeybee swarms and the, the very dense aggregation that they create in the mechanical forces that manifest their de decision making. Um, and the second set of problems I'm going to talk about is um, a fields of airflow. Um, and uh, in particular, how honeybees uh, ventilate oh, their hive and use. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, airflows um, and how they're being used to communicate also within large groups of honeybees. Um, and uh, I want to point out uh, that uh, this is I'm going to I'm going to talk about um, uh, some work that I did back in, when I was a postdoc at Harvard uh, together with uh, Jacob Peters. Uh, Mary Salcedo, uh, both were graduate students at the time, and our advisor, uh, Mahadevan. And I'll also um, intersperse, you know, in between these, these two themes, uh, some new um, projects that are going on in my lab uh, right now. Okay, so uh, let's start with the mechanics. Um, so this is a, an example of a honeybee swarm. Um, that uh, this is a phenomenon that occurs as part of a reproductive cycle of European honeybees. At some point uh, during the spring and summer months, uh, the colony size increases and they split into two parts. Um, and then one part and a queen fly away and they hang like this from, from a tree branch. Um, and when they're doing so, they don't have a nest structure to protect themselves from the elements and they have to adapt to, to environmental factors uh, more dynamically. Uh, and indeed, they, they do. We know that uh, from work of uh, Tom Seeley and later on also Mahadevan, um, that uh, honeybees, um, the swarms can actually adapt their density um, for uh, the environmental temperature. So here on the right side, there is a swarm at cold temperatures. It's going to be more dense in comparison to a swarm that is uh, present at higher ambient temperatures. They also respond to rain uh, and they, uh, I hope you can see that. So in the picture here is the rain, they arrange themselves in um, almost pneumatic order uh, and presumably that makes the swarm less susceptible to water. Um, and then at really high temperatures, it's been speculated that the bees create channels that allow for flow of uh, air uh, and exchange air from uh, the colder environment uh, and the warmer swarm. So um, all of this is, of course, very complicated and a complex uh, a set of skills that the bees have. But underneath all of this, there is um, a hard mechanical problem. Um, so um, I want to uh, emphasize that in this picture here on the left side, there's nothing besides bees and a tree branch. So the bees are essentially holding, um, holding hands, air brackets, uh, uh, to, create, to create that structure. Um, and they need to adapt to several uh, mechanical stimuli from the environment. Uh, they need to adapt to um, static uh, mechanical forces that are coming from gravity. Um, and they also need to adapt to um, more dynamic mechanical forces that are coming from potentially wind. Uh, so here is a, a swarm that we found a, on, a, on a windy day. This branch, I hope you can see the movie. Uh, this swarm is being shaken. Um, and uh, if it's gonna 
be shaking too much, it's going to break. And if it breaks, um, that could be pretty catastrophic for the bees. Uh, they can fall to the ground, not find their way back to the swarm. And that basically kills the stem regulation purpose of that structure, uh, which is one of the main reasons it, it exists in the first place. So the bees basically huddle to, uh, to also warm up. So um, we wanted to understand how the bees maintain mechanical stability in these large swarms. There are, um, on average, uh, tens of thousands of individuals in each one of these swarms. So uh, in this funny <laughs> little illustration, I I'm, I'm just want to uh, point out that a bee at one side of the swarm um, can potentially coordinate its activity with other, other bees uh, that are nearby, but it can certainly not directly communicate a, and coordinate its activity with a bee that is at the other side of the swarm. And mechanical stability sometimes really demands this um, uh, simultaneous coordination throughout uh, the structure. So we wanted to understand um, what kind of local mechanical signals the bees could be potentially using in order to stabilize the swarm. Um, and to do that, uh, we worked with uh, real honeybees. Um, I always like to point out that this was my first venture into experiments until that I was comfortably sitting behind the computer simulating uh, some other problems. <laughs> um, so this was uh, really fun. Uh, and um, we worked at the Concord Field Station, uh, which is not far away from Harvard. And this was our experimental setup. So. Um, we have uh, the swarm attached to a wooden board um, and we uh, connected it to a motor that can basically shake the board at certain frequencies and, and accelerations. And then we just recorded um, the shape of the swarm from several uh, different angles as a function of time. So that was the setup. It's actually a pretty simple do-it-yourself <laughs> kind of uh, setup. Um, and then we also had a, a version where we shake the bees uh, vertically as well. Um, so it was a, um, started as an exploratory project, uh, but um, after the first couple of tries, we realized that when we shake the bees uh, horizontally, um, uh, after a while, the bees inside the swarm st starts moving around inside the swarm, and they collectively change the aspect ratio of the swarm. So here is a fast forward um, uh, version of, of that experiment. So we have the front view, the bottom view. We are shaking them uh, right and left. Um, and here is how it looks like. So um, we start with a cone-like structure that has a certain base area and height. Uh, and when we shake them, the bees uh, spread out and they increase the surface area, the attachment base area, and decrease the height. And then when we stop shaking them, let me point it out. So that's right now. So now we're stopping shaking them. So they um, are slowly starting to converge back to their steady state configuration. Um, OK, so uh, we decided to, to continue studying this a bit more systematically. Um, so a couple of things one can do with this, this kind of setup is to change the uh, frequency or to change the uh, acceleration that we apply on the board. And that's exactly what we did. So um, what you see here um, on the this plot on the y-axis, that's the relative base area that we can see from the bottom view as a function of time. Uh, the different colors are the different um, uh, frequencies that we applied on the swarm. Um, and that dotted line is where we stop the, the perturbation and continue recording to see how the swarm slowly go back to, to its steady state. Um, so um, perhaps, you know, not too surprising, uh, when the frequency is increasing, um, we see that the swarm spreads out more. So the, more, the higher the frequency, the more the spread out is. Um, um, but because we're changing the frequency here, we can also plot the data a little bit differently uh, where uh, instead of as we plotting it as a function of time, we can plot it as a function of perturbation events, where perturbation event is one uh, shake to the right and one shake to the left. Um, and we can see that they all fall on this uh, universal curve, uh, besides, of course, reaching uh, different plateau values. And I'll get to these different plateau values in a few slides, but I just wanted to show this because 
uh, for us, this was an indication that there is actually a universal response uh, to each one of these bumping events. Um, okay, so that was the effect of frequency. And next we turn to study the effect of acceleration, which is shown here. It's exactly the same plot. So the y-axis is showing the relative base area as a function of time. And just like before, the higher the frequency, the more the swarm spreads out. Um, and then, you know, everything I just showed you is, is what happens when we shake the bees right and left, but we also had the ability to shake them up and down. And surprisingly, when we shake them up and down, um, the bees do not respond in the same way that they did to the horizontal perturbation. Uh, they don't spread. And actually, um, at some point, uh, the forces become too, too high and the bees actually, the swarm actually breaks. Um, so uh, we didn't really explore that, that regime too much. Uh, we wanted to understand um, how the bees um, respond to horizontal perturbation and vertical perturbation so differently uh, and why they do so. Um, and to answer that question, we uh, turned into a, a, a mathematical, mechanical model of, of the swarm as an elastic material where we're basically going to take snapshots of the swarm at different aspect ratios as it spreads out or it goes back to, to equilibrium. And the reason we do this is because the time scale in which we apply the perturbation is much smaller in comparison to the time scale that it takes the bees to spread out. So we are talking about um, you know, seconds of, for the perturbation, one hertz and so on, versus uh, 15 minutes to half an hour uh, where it takes the, the, the swarm to spread out. Okay, and uh, so I'm gonna move to the model, but I, I realized I forgot to say that if anybody has any questions, I'm really happy to take them. You know, now it doesn't, you don't have to wait until the end. So just uh, please, please let me know. Um, okay, so, so the model was um, a fairly simple representation of a bee. It's just a, a sphere, a kind of what physicists do. Uh, so the, the spheres are no, now going to be connected by elastic springs to um, other individual bees. And we arrange them like this in a cone-like structure, but while keeping the top layer uh, uh, fixed. And the first thing we did was to look at the normal model analysis of, of, these, um, of these structures. Um, for those of you who are uh, maybe not familiar with that method, um, all we're doing is um, writing down the force equations uh, based on the spring potential uh, and assume small deformations of the bonds. Uh, and then we have a very large set of coupled uh, force equations, F equals MA, that we put into a matrix form and then we solve it numerically. Um, by solving it numerically, we can get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of these, these metrics and we can tell what would be the most typical modes of motion that would ex be expected for that, that structure. Um, and we see that these modes are a pendular mode where everything shakes right and left, um, and also a spring mode where everything stretches up and down. Um, we can also look at the frequency of those modes. Uh, the lower the frequency, the easiest it is to actually invoke those modes and the more likely they are to occur. Um, so uh, this is what is being shown here on, on the right side. So we have on the y-axis, we have the frequency as a function of the aspect ratio. And we see uh, two important things. The first one is um, as the swarm becomes more elongated, it becomes, um, the frequency decreases. So it's easier to invoke these modes. Um, but also there is always a gap between the spring and the pendular mode. It's always a little bit easier to invoke the pendulum mode in comparison to the spring mode. Um, and this is actually something that we uh, can see in the experiments. So here is a slow-mo movie of a horizontal perturbation. And we see that there is a propagating wave of deformation that uh, moves down um, towards the swarm. And then at the end, we invoke this uh, pendulum mode. And then, um, if we apply the same uh, perturbation, the only difference now is it's, it's uh, up and down instead of right and left. Uh, this is how it looks like. So um, 
the deformation here is really is really small in comparison to uh, the horizontal case, but I hope you can see there's a little bit of that stretch mode um, where everything kind of stretches up and down. Um, so the fact that the bees respond to the horizontal perturbation and don't respond to the, um, sorry, the, the fact that the bees respond to the horizontal perturbation but don't respond to the vertical one suggests that maybe uh, one of the signals that they are using as a cue is the local deformation of the bonds between uh, nearest neighbors bees. So um, to test that we go back to the model but now we have uh, a more dynamic version of the model where um, we still have um, spheres connected by elastic springs uh, but now we are solving explicitly the equations of motion as a function of time and looking at the dynamics of that, um, of that material. Uh, so uh, we have um, added a few things here. We have some excluded volume and gravity, and we also added a little bit of friction uh, to make sure that the swarm actually stops uh, uh, shaking as a pendulum after a while, which we also see in the experiments. Um, so we're going to uh, specifically focus on uh, local uh, stretching of, of bonds. Uh, so for each individual bee, we're going to look at all the connections to neighboring bees um, and measure how much they stretch as a function of time and take a geometrical average of this. Uh, so that's, that's what we're doing and it's summarizing this really long scary equation, but really we're just taking the um, uh, geometrical average of all of the stretchings and we're going to look at it as a function of time. Um, okay, so a couple of uh, sanity checks. Um, here is a, a three-dimensional swarm. It's cut in the, in the, along the plane of the slide so that we can see what's happening inside. Um, and the colors correspond to the amount of shear that is experienced on average for all the bonds of an individual. Uh, blue means low deformation and, and yellow means high. Um, so for horizontal perturbation, we see that there's quite a lot of uh, shear at the, at the, closer to the base of the swarm. Um, and then if we apply the same perturbation vertically, like in the experiments, like in the normal model analysis, we see that there is less of that uh, local deformation. Um, we can also take a look at the aspect ratio effect. So here is on the right side, again, the same movie from the previous slide, an elongated swarm compared to a spread out swarm. You can see that there's much less um, uh, deformation that occurs um, inside the swarm. Um, so effectively, when the bees move from the elongated configuration to the spread out configuration, um, they also reduce those um, local deformations of bonds to nearest neighbors. So um, the last thing that I wanted to, to show with this uh, kind of simulation is going back to the fact that we get different plateau values for the spreading. So there's more spreading uh, at higher frequencies in comparison to low frequencies. Uh, this is a bit of a hand wavy explanation for that. So what we think is going on is that at low frequency, we shake the swarm once, has enough time to relax before the next perturbation. Uh, but at high frequency, the swarm doesn't have that privilege and effectively we're creating uh, more strains, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, not just at the base, but throughout the swarm. Okay, so we have a really good candidate for a local signal that the bees might be using. Uh, to stabilize their structure. Um, and now just as a proof of concept, um, we uh, decided to plug everything into an agent-based simulations where our uh, spheres can now actually sense those local uh, stretching of bonds to their neighbors and decide to do something about it. Um, so let me, sh let me tell you what we did here. So um, we basically integrate the, the, the local signal, the, the stretching of bonds, uh, over uh, one perturbation. So this is how it would look like, one shake to the right, one shake to the left, and then we're summing up uh, all the deformations that is shown here as a color, color scale. Um, same thing for the um, vertical one. Um, and then uh, just as a proof of concept, I'm gonna um, decide that there's gonna be some threshold above which these uh, bees or sphere are going to become active and do something about stabilizing the swarm. I uh, chose it in a way that not um, a lot of the bees in the vertical case would get uh, activated to be consistent with the experiment. Um, 
So we have a threshold, we have a signal. Now we just need to tell the bees uh, what to do. Um, one thing that we see in the experiments is that the bees are crawling upwards on the surface. So we could potentially direct them and say, you know, also in this uh, agent-based model, please go upwards uh, when, when you experience uh, uh, the local signal reaching the threshold. Um, but we were not really sure that bees inside a congested and shaky environment would know uh, where upward is. So we decided to implement that rule based on local information. So knowing where upward is will require a global frame, a point of view or framework. Uh, and we decided to implement it just based on the local one. If we take the gradient of that local signal of deformation, which is being uh, shown here with the little black arrows, um, basically pointing the bees upwards uh, and a little bit to the sides. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that's basically it. And now we plug everything together. And indeed we see that um, um, for horizontal perturbation, we get uh, the swarm to spread out and for a vertical perturbation, not so much because of the way, of, because of the way we chose these parameters. Um, but the important thing is that we can reproduce the behavior of the bees, I think, with these uh, sets of local rules. So um, to summarize what I showed you so far, um, I showed you that um, honeybees swarms regulate their shape in order to uh, potentially become less susceptible to mechanical perturbations. They're uh, sensitive to directionality, to force, to frequency. Um, what we think is going on is that they modulate the aspect ratio uh, to minimal, minimize local deformation between um, uh, nearest neighbors' uh, bees. Um, and um, I want to point out, you know, it's, it's kind of philosophical, but, but it's something that is worth thinking about. Um, in a sense, the bees, when they climb upwards, they move from areas that experience lower strains to areas that experience higher amounts of strains. Uh, and they do this for the greater good of the entire colony. So in a sense, it's a little bit like mechanical altruism. Um, and, but to put this you know, in more, uh, more back to the ground um, the, uh, and connect it to the theme of this talk, um, I want to um, kind of summarize it as, as in, the bees, um, it seems what the bees is, is doing is locally sense global fields of mechanical strains that are much longer, has much longer range than the um, a size of an individual. And they manage a way to sense them and perturb them uh, in a way that would help them uh, survive mechanical perturbations. So um, that's, that's it with the shaking story. Uh, there are a few more things going on in my lab. Uh, related to the mechanics that I wanted to point out. Um, one is that um, we are now uh, trying to um, understand how the bees form these swarms uh, from the air. Um, this is, a, a, you know, back, back, back at Harvard, um, we worked with the bees um, in a shed, so the bees were actually the door was open, the bees were able to uh, explore the environment. And then as some of you probably know, uh, they only stay in this uh, uh, configuration temporarily. They actually make a decision using the waggle dance uh, on where to move and build their more permanent uh, nest. So um, uh, they did this in, in, in our experiments and they just flew off. Um, but which was very um, nerve wracking. I personally thought we lost the bees. Um, but then they came back after a couple of minutes. Um, and that's probably because uh, we had a queen in a cage uh, to set up that swarm in the first place. So um, uh, they just came back and, and constructed the swarm uh, from the air after a few minutes. So while it was nerve wracking for the first set of experiments, it was it actually a very useful a convenient way to study um, how the bees form the structure and, and track it as a function of time. Uh, so here is a, an example of that where now we are looking from the side uh, and the bees flew off and when I started this movie they started coming back uh, creating that structure again.
and um, so it's a little bit hard to see by eye in this fast fast movie, but um, the shape that they create uh, right when they they start creating the swarm is very different from their steady state more equilibrium shape. So the the shape that they create right in the beginning it looks like a casp uh, casp like shape is shown here in red, whereas um, the the equilibrium shape is more like a droplet. So it has a different curvature. Um, and this is work in progress, but we think that um, the casp-like shape actually has some mechanical stability advantages over the droplet-like shape, which we can show with normal model analysis. And uh, this is a work in progress that we are now summarizing into a paper. Um, another um, uh, project uh, going on relating to the mechanics uh, in my lab is um, asking the question, what happens inside the swarm? So, so far, what I showed you and what we knew uh, is only what happens at the surface of the swarm, because we cannot really see through it. Um, and um, now we have an X-ray uh, set up in the lab where we can um, basically put the swarm inside an X-ray um, and do a 3D reconstruction. And by doing so, we can uh, take a look at uh, the density inside the swarm. And we see a couple of interesting things. First of all, there are these layers of bees uh, that you can see here in the top figure. Um, so they're very, they're also very dense in these areas, um, which would make sense to do uh, because the bees here at the top, the base of the swarm, they're holding the weight of everybody else. So from a mechanical perspective, again, it makes sense to, um, uh, uh, prioritize and add more uh, bees to that, to those layers. Um, okay, but this is all still work in progress. Please stay tuned um, uh, hopefully this will come out soon. Okay, so um, this is uh, all I had about uh, the mechanical stability. I'm gonna move to the ventilation. Does anybody have any questions about the mechanics before I move on to a different topic? Yes, Arid. If I if I may, yeah. I have a question. So if I understood well in in your model, you you are modeling the the single animal as a sphere, and yes. uh, you are modeling the the collective in terms of forces between them. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we mm -hmm. translate mm -hmm. this into the animal, the animal would have proprio receptors uh, sensing the stretch, maybe on the legs. Yes. Yes. An alternative possibility would be that the animal is sensing the distance. Um, so that by being sort of mm -hmm. pulled apart, there is more mm -hmm. distance to the neighbor. Now, that would probably change your entire model, but mm -hmm. for the bee, it would be mm -hmm. an interesting thing because the bee that is walking mm -hmm. on top of the hive or on top of the, of the swarm can sense the distance, but cannot sense the force. Uh, and that would give the sort of meandering bee a possibility to decide where to integrate into the network. Uh, so my question is, did you consider thinking about distance between your spheres instead of forces between the spheres, thus uh, giving the possibility of integrating new individuals into your whatever shape you have? Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you for bringing it out. Um, I did not consider this before, but just as you were, you were speaking, I was a couple of thoughts that came are that um, First of all, technically, you know, the distance between bees is uh, linearly proportional to the force. If we're thinking about linear springs, that's not, not maybe that's not the case with the, you know, the real bees, uh, but the, at least in the model. Um, but um, now that we actually know that there, the density inside the swarm is non-homogeneous, so that means that the distance between bees closer to the base will be shorter in comparison to the distance to the bees um, at the tip. Um, I mean, I, I, I think this could also explain it. So it would be really interesting to think about this. And, and um, it's a little bit tricky to test this directly with the bees because um, it's hard to know if they're sensing distance or sensing force. Um, and actually everything that I showed, you know, it's kind of should probably take it with a grain of salt because we don't really know what the bees are sensing. Um, this is just a, a set of local rules that would explain their behavior. 
Um, so yeah, I would love to think more about the distance. And um, I think I think it could also work. Okay, so I'm gonna move to um, the um, next set of, of physical uh, uh, fields, uh, and that's gonna be fields of flow. Um, so um, again, this is this is work that I did uh, back uh, at Harvard. Actually, my contribution here was only uh, related to the mathematical model. Uh, Jake Peters was running this project and um, uh, running all the experimental work and analysis. Um, so um, let me tell you a little, give you a little bit of background. Um, many social insects, as you all probably know, um, create and build their, their nest structures in a way that allows for a passive ventilation, such as um, um, termite mounds or these end mounds. Um, but bees, at least, especially uh, at least, you know, in this part of the, the world where we work with them, uh, tend to um, nest inside pre-existing cavities. So they don't have the privilege of um, uh, designing their, their nests uh, so that it would allow for passive ventilation. Uh, so they live inside these cavities in trees. Here are two examples of this. They can have a wide range of um, shapes of the entrance. Here are two extreme ones. Uh, and they also have some other criteria. Um, but the point is that they, they really need to do something active in order to ventilate their hive. Um, so um, what it turns out that the bees are doing is position themselves in front of the entrance of the hive. Um, for a commercial uh, beekeeping hive, uh, for those of you, you know, I, I guess I, sh I should assume you're familiar, but okay. If, uh, um, uh, if you haven't seen one, it's really just a box and it has a very, very narrow slit um, that, that allows the bees to go in and out of the hive. Sometimes there are other entrances, but this is the main one. Um, so the bees basically position themselves in front of the entrance and they fan their wings. Um, and by fanning the wings, they're creating airflow um, in this, uh, as, as you can see here in this movie that um, actually was recorded by Jake Peters in another study. Um, and so they move air backwards. Um, and then if one bee does this um, in front of the entrance, nothing really happens because it's so small in comparison to the size of the nest uh, or the, the hive. Uh, so what happens is that they, they arrange themselves in groups of fanning bees and um, they all fan together and this way they are able to create a um, more global airflow that allows them to ventilate the hive. Um, okay, so there are a couple of challenges when thinking about this aggregation process where fanning bees aggregate together. Uh, as you can see here, this is a, a picture with an example of the uh, entrance of the hive. And we have on the right side of the entrance um, a higher density of bees that are, that are fanning in comparison to the left side. So we refer to that as an aggregation. Um, the challenges are, uh, the two challenges that I want to mention here. The first one is fluid friction. Um, so let's assume that uh, we have um, uh, one set of bees on, on one side of the entrance. They're all fanning in the same direction. So they're driving air backwards. Uh, because of conservation of mass, we're gonna have a compensation uh, of air that comes into the hive uh, from the colder environment. And in this case, we, we have one main interface between these opposing flows. Of course, we also have the sides. Um, but if we had uh, many different groups of these bees that are fanning, um, we would have more of these interfaces um, and we're gonna have more energy loss due to fluid friction. So that's one thing to think about. Um, the other one is um, sometimes we refer to it as antagonism. Um, so if we have um, a group of bees that are fanning on one side of the entrance and they're creating this nice global airflow, um, if other bees would stand at the other side of the, on the left side in this case, of the entrance, um, they would sort of fight each other and they would, so if these bees would try to create opposing flow to the ones that are, that is uh, created by the, the first group of bees, then again, we're gonna lose some energy due to that. Um, so keeping this in mind, um, uh, the question that, that we wanted to ask was, um, again, what kind of local signal 
um, from the environment could the bees be using uh, in order to arrange themselves in groups of um, uh, fanning bees uh, and av avoid all this energy loss from uh, fluid friction and, and antagonism. Okay, so this uh, is a movie from the first set of uh, experiments that uh, Jake ran. Uh, and right now we're looking at, the, this is an aerial view of, of that hive. Uh, and Jake is basically moving um, a measurement device that can measure airflow and temperature. Let me just uh, move this a little bit faster. So he's basically putting this in, in all the positions uh, along uh, the entrance. Um, and this uh, set of experiments was very useful uh, because it uh, showed that um, the air velocity, the temperature, and the density of fanning bees is all coupled. So um, this is what you're seeing here. The x-axis is just a position along the, the entrance of the hive, and then the temperature in red, the density in black, and the velocity in, in blue, they're all coupled. Uh, so wherever we have bees that are um, fanning, then they're going to drive hotter air from the in, from inside the nest, um, and so the temperature is going to increase, but also the airflow is going to increase because they're doing so via uh, fanning their wings that create airflow. The computation, the, the mathematical and computational model that uh, we applied here, um, assume that we are working with um, a, a one-dimensional entrance, so it's a one-dimensional system. Uh, we have three quantities. One is the density of the bees that are fanning. Uh, we have the temperature entrance, uh, the entrance temperature, uh, and the air velocity. Um, and we're going to make a couple of assumptions um, that uh, some of them I already mentioned. So um, uh, bees um, drive air uh, coming out of the hive, which we know that they do because we can see that they are positioned towards the entrance and we know that they are driving air backwards. Um, the second assumption is that uh, bees are more likely to fan uh, at higher temperatures. And this is based on a different set of studies uh, by the group of my breed, actually also here in CU Boulder, uh, that show that um, uh, there is a threshold temperature above which there is a higher probability that the bees would start fanning. Um, and same thing for stopping to fan. So we're going to use that also in the, as a plugin to the mathematical model. Um, we assume conservation of volume. So for any cube of air that comes out, there's going to have to be a cube of air that, that is coming in to compensate for that. Um, and the last thing is, which I also already mentioned, is that velocity gradients uh, incur, uh, create friction. Okay, so this is all in words. Now let me put this in a mathematical form. Um, so we're going to have a, a couple of equations. The first one is an equation that connects the density of bees that are fanning uh, to the on and off rate uh, uh, of the fanning behavior that is based on the position and the temperature along the entrance. Uh, the second one is Newton's law of cooling. So we're basically connecting uh, the temperature um, inside and outside and at the entrance using this physical law. And we're going to um, use that to determine the new temperature at each time step. Um, and then the last one is um, an equation that couples the air velocity uh, to the uh, friction uh, from opposing flows, which we uh, simplify as just a diffusive uh, force that acts on the, on the velocity here, highlighted in red. Uh, and we also include the conservation of volume here. Uh, so these are all the equations, and now uh, we're basically going to solve them numerically. Um, so here is an example of such a, a numerical solution as a function of time. Uh, let me just orient you here. The y-axis is the position along the entrance of the hive, and the x-axis is the time, so how many iterations we have in, in the numerical solution of the set of equations. And the color corresponds to the density of bees that are, that are fanning. Um, so we can see that um, the left side of that plot, um, early, uh, early in the uh, uh, simulation, we have a somewhat random distribution of bees that are fanning along the entrance. And then we have these two bigger clusters that emerge. And at some point, one of these clusters 
um, dissolves and, and is sort of absorbed by uh, the bigger cluster. So we get one uh, big cluster of these that are fanning, um, and they create this uh, global airflow in and out of the hive. Um, as a sanity check, we can also look at um, uh, the cost of friction, uh, which is shown here um, in blue uh, as a function of time. So we can see that uh, when we reduce the number of, when we start to get these larger and larger clusters, then also the um, uh, cost of friction uh, reduces. And that is uh, coupled with an increase in the, um, uh, what we refer to here as the order parameter, which is basically telling us um, how large the clusters that we get. So uh, when the order parameter is larger, we have a um, higher tendency to have larger clusters of, of fanning bees. When it's zero, then we have this more random distribution. So both of these are, are coupled. Um, okay, so um, now we can actually uh, use that model to um, uh, create some uh, predictions for longer time scale. Uh, how how the the dynamics of that cluster would behave as a function of, of time. Um, and here are three examples of, of these simulations. So on the left, I'm showing um, an example of, of, uh, of the um, temperature and position of the, the cluster um, uh, what, when, which happens at lower temperatures. So we get um, a cluster that is kind of fluctuating and moving around a lot. Uh, uh, along the, the position um, at the entrance. At uh, higher temperatures, ambient temperatures, we get a cluster that is still moving, but it has a higher tendency to kind of uh, stick to one side uh, of the, of the, at the entrance. And then at really high temperatures, which is shown here on the right, uh, it's getting uh, challenging or difficult to distinguish between the temperature inside and outside of the hive, so we just don't get any clusters at all. Um, okay, so um, then Jake went, went back uh, to the experiments to test his predictions, and he designed this really cool um, chip where um, it was covered by glass, so we can actually leave it uh, at the entrance of the hive for longer periods of time. Uh, and it was automatically logging in the temperature data along the entrance. So each one of these droplets here are temperature measurement device that um, measures the temperatures and it was positioned slightly uh, above the bees in, in a way that it wouldn't interfere with their uh, fanning behavior. So this is a, an example of how this looks like. So um, this allowed uh, Jake to obtain some um, longer uh, uh, measurements of, of that behavior. So here is an example of that for three consecutive days. Uh, the top plot here is showing the ambient temperature as a function of time. So we are showing it for three consecutive days. You can see the three uh, day-night cycles here in the temperature data. Um, and uh, at the bottom plot uh, is shown the, the the temperature along the entrance, which is uh, we know is also a proxy for uh, the position of the bees that are that are fanning. Um, the interesting thing is that we can actually um, reproduce these two regimes that were predicted by the model, where at higher temperatures we have um, a cluster of fanning bees that kind of uh, stick to one side of the entrance, and then. Um, at uh, lower ambient temperatures, we have a cluster that diffuses more. Um, okay, so that's that's what I wanted to say about uh, the, the fanning. Um, again, to put this in the context of uh, sensing uh, physical fields, I think here we can sort of think about this problem as a local sensing of temperature gradients uh, or temperature uh, measurements and by doing so, the bees can um, impose the airflow that create global uh, channels of air that is coming in and out of the hive. Um, and uh, also here, there's um, some um, extensions that I'm, I'm currently working on in my lab that I just wanted to mention very, very briefly. Um, so, um, 
uh, there's there's another behavior that honeybees uh, perform, which uh, is is relying on fanning, uh, but it's also uh, at the same time uh, advecting pheromones. Um, so honeybees have uh, the nasal gland, which is shown here at the left figure. It's it looks like a very very thin white line, um, and then um, they they kind of stick their abdomen upwards and open up that pheromone gland and then add airflow that is created by them fanning their wings. So essentially they are dispersing those pheromones in a very uh, specific direction. So it depends on their body access. Um, so this is work that was done, uh, is led by Dumai, who is a PhD student in my lab, but also in collaboration with uh, Greg Stephens and Kesha, uh, who is a postdoc now, she's a faculty in Germany. Um, we wanted to understand how um, the bees use those signals in order to um, stay coherent and aggregate around the queen. So, uh, oops, let me stop this for a second. So um, here is an example for, for an, a behavioral assay that we are running. So uh, we are confining the bees into a semi two dimensional arena and we're looking at it from the top here. We dumped the, a group of bees here on one corner and then in the other corner we have the queen that the bees have to um, uh, to find and aggregate around. Um, and uh, actually the contribution from Greg and Kesha was to help us uh, come up with a, um, a machine learning um, a code to automatically detect those uh, scenting events. So that was um, really important for, for that project. So we can see you know, all these arrows that you see here are the direction in which these pheromones are spread. Um, and um, if I just move this a little bit quicker, at the end we see that the bees um, uh, aggregate around the queen. Um, we see that um, the, um, if we, we take all of these uh, uh, directions of scenting and sum them up together, integrate together, we see that indeed um, the, the bees are pointing uh, uh, the rest of the bees towards the queen, which is in, uh, uh, shown here as this uh, um, surface. Um, and uh, we also connect this to a agent-based simulation where we can um, have agents that uh, advect that signal. Um, and when we put them together in a, in a simulation uh, arena, then we can also follow that aggregation uh, uh, stage. And um, interestingly, the directionality of that signal uh, is really important uh, and helps the bees uh, potentially um, overcome local equilibrium configuration where um, they aggregate into smaller clusters. So if you wanna um, hear, um, know more about this, the, the, this um, draft is currently on the bioarchive. Um, and okay, I see that I'm, I think I'm kind of running out of time, but I just have one more slide um, that I wanted to show here um, on a on a slight, you know, very different, uh, different but similar, you know, different, I would say, uh, project. But I wanted to just um, uh, mention this here because I think many of uh, you here in the group are thinking about synchronization. So uh, I just wanted to mention that I'm also working on. Uh, firefly communication and how they synchronize their their patterns. So um, uh, fireflies have the bioluminescence um, uh, 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 lamp, a uh, lantern in their abdomen, and they use that uh, to create a mating dialogue with, between males and females. Um, and they, there are some species who synchronize their flashes. It's a beautiful uh, phenomenon. I really recommend everybody to see it at least once in their lifetime. Um, in the last couple of years, um, me and, and Raphael, who is a postdoc in my lab, and Julie, who is a student, went to the Great Smoky Mountains uh, in Tennessee, in the US, and uh, we had a setup where we can actually reconstruct the three-dimensional uh, spatiotemporal pattern of the flashes. Uh, we just uh, published the methods paper about this, but there's a lot, um, a lot in the work related to um, what kind of um, mathematical models could explain this behavior uh, and so on. So um, if you invite me again, I'll be happy to talk about this or otherwise just stay tuned. Um, and uh, let me just put this acknowledgement slide where I just wanna thank everybody who 
for a work with um, and also my new lab that is shown here. This is Halloween, pre-COVID pre Halloween. <laughs> um, and all the funding, all my funding sources and, and thank you all so much for your attention and happy to take any questions now. <laughs> Michael Smith um, works on oh, yeah. Honeybee. Hey, Orit, how's it going? Hello, good, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Yeah, I um, yeah, great talk. I'm really, I, I, it was really nice to watch. I was actually so one of the questions I had about the the Nest ventilation system, and it, that is that I think it's a really cool system that you're able to model it in a two dimensional way when you have a Langstroth colony, but the size of those entrances is is so radically different than what you would see in a natural nest, and so. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, obviously, I think, okay, obviously you have to like make certain conditions, but I was wondering what you might think would occur when you have a more naturalistic entrance that, you know, it's like a knot hole and that the bees actually have to deal with all this different variation in the size of their entrance. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And um, we don't really have any data on this um, besides some anecdotal information from the literature. Um, so there is a species of honeybees um, and I'm blanking out on the name, but um, I think they're they're not a, they're not living in the U.S. Um, but uh, when they have a very small um, entrance, um, they 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 so they don't have the ability to position a lot of bees uh, at the entrance, even if they wanted to. So what's happening is that they move into a different uh, strategy where they all fan at the same time for a couple of seconds and then they all stop fanning for for a couple of seconds and if you think about this it's kind of like breathing so they uh create air it, it's not two channels of airflow there's only one and they uh, alternate the flow in and out uh, uh, intermittently so that that's probably all i can say about um what happens in 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 you know feral real real hives or you know with honeybees, but um, I, if I remember correctly, you have a lot of experience working with feral colonies, and if you want to think about that problem, I'll be happy to talk more. Yeah, no, I think honestly, like this is probably something for us to just uh, to email back and forth about. But one of the things, and this is very rare to see, is that you'll sometimes actually see honeybees, even Apis mellifera, they will actually use propolis to further decrease their entrance size. So you can imagine, like imagine your normal entrance. And they'll actually will even build propolis up. They're always building these walls. And they actually, I mean, the, the size of their entrance can be so minuscule that it's like as, as a beekeeper, you think, oh God, these bees are gonna, are gonna suffocate themselves. So really, I'd be really interested in kind of, I mean, cause in these, it's very rare to see them actually build these, like kind of reduce their entrances, but even those, they actually have multiple entrances. So it's almost like this alignment that you're seeing, you might actually even get a, a more, um, a more act like a more extreme version in these natural nests. Um, but yeah, it'd be really cool to look at in a natural system. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed the talk. So thanks for thanks for talking. Oh yeah, thank you so much. On that point of um, nest uh, of entrance constriction, um, I also did work with honeybees a lifetime ago, and my advisor at the time would always tell me that it was a defense against. The, the, the constriction of the entrance was a defense against a hive beetle. Um, and so, it, I mean, whether or not that's true, um, it's an interesting uh, sort of discussion where here everything is being um, thought about and discussed in the context of a single optimization problem. But of course, in a natural system, it's never a single um, optimization problem. Um, and so I do wonder how, uh, how these things um, interact that actually wasn't my question though um okay the question um was actually maybe you, you, there's no answer to this or it's not yet known but i found it very interesting the figure you put up about the response to rain um and mm -hmm. the uh, polarization of individuals in the rain um the first thing that springs to mind of course is well could it be otherwise um what kind of bee would be able even under heavy load of water to, to take a position that was any different to that. Um, and so, so, and then the second question that sort of leads from that is, is, is this sort of response to a medium like water, a liquid medium, an exaggeration of how they would respond 
down to airflow or is it a completely, is it sort of a difference in degree or is it a difference in kind? And could you think of some clever experiments where you manipulated the density of the, of the medium that they were in to really probe some of these questions you have about channeling and flow? Okay, okay. So you're saying um, it's all fluid dynamics, whether it's air or water, right? And then... Well, so you could ask that question, I guess, by forcing yeah. fluid dynamics on the system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I think there is definitely ways to manipulate the, um, you know, the regime of, of flow you would expect. Um, uh, but but I think it would be a bit challenging to do with bees. Like you cannot really put them inside viscous materials to simulate sure. low Reynolds number and stuff like this. Um, but if you increase the so, flow of air mm -hmm. over a group to to be very very yeah. strong. Would they take up this exact orientation as they do in rain, do you think? Um, that's a really interesting thing that wouldn't be too out there <laughs> to try uh, with a fan or something like this, just to see you know, what, what happens. That's, that's an interesting idea. Um, by the way, as, as far as I know, I, I, I'm also not sure that um, people really understand the advantage of creating those um, th that ordering of, of the bees in response to rain it you know resembles uh, roof shingles so there is a I think the, I definitely have the intuition that it it helps uh, with uh, wetting but it has I don't think it has been systematically studied so even studying it with just water I think would be very interesting yeah I wonder is michael maybe you know is it apis dorsata that has these huge ones that have these open that does this um defensive rippling in in response to predators that that would be one of a species that has these open combs that i imagine would frequently get rained on um which might be an easier system to look at it Yes, it, it is Apis dorsata that does that. And actually the positioning that you get, those bees with the tip of their abdomen kind of pointed out, is very similar to what the dorsata waves to prevent um, other individuals from landing on. Um, Alex, I don't know if this is an inappropriate question to ask, but can I share an image with Orit or just to yeah. send it to her? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I think, Wait, but I think it, the answer is would yes. It be yes. Very, well, because the reason I was actually, so when you, I, I was like, oh, I should show that propolized entrance. And as I was looking through my photos, which understandably is all bee photos, I have no photos of friends, just bees. I actually <laughs> found a stingless bee nest that actually I think would maybe get to that kind of three dimensional question. Um, and it looks like they could almost even have like an inflow and an outflow in the single tube. I can maybe, I can send, I, you know, I can email wow. it to you, but basically just imagine a yeah. tube and they're all arranged in a circle. So you could think of an, an inflow and an outflow in the same way. Um, but this is for stingless bees. I don't know how much fanning they do, but it's just, it's just I don't know, just cool stuff to send Very around. Cool. Was that in the US? Um, this particular image that I'm looking at is from Panama. Okay. Yeah, cool, I would love to see it. Hey man, field seasons. It's, what, it's the, reason, the reason we do biology. Yes. 